back for the end of the day is Leslie Schneider. Okay. Uh, who didn't finish. I mean, I don't know what he came up And who's the lady on the far left? Okay. Thanks, yeah. That's Leslie Schneider. Oh, yeah.
slaves and would be taken to the Rayuans of uh, summer home. Uh, but anyway, uh, there was something strange about it. People have been talking about how, what a social person Jimmy Gibson was. And this was not the kind of situation uh, that he appreciated. Um, me and my wife then, you know, we didn't dare to do anything about this for a while, but we noticed that Jimmy Gibson sort of what was wandering, stayed there, wandering around and back and forth, you know, not knowing what to do. And we were discussing whether we could, you know, uh, uh, approach such a, a prominent person with any, anything. But finally he came to us and said, if, if, what if, if we had a newspaper with, uh, where, where, where um, he could find a movie to go to. And then we realized he's looking for He's looking for company, so uh, we did find a newspaper and we did find a movie, uh, which we all went to, and, and it happened to be one of those absurd Czech movies, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, very strange one. Uh, and uh, you mean, they were speaking Czech, of course, they were speaking Swedish sometimes. <laughs>
can't say that we came to firm conclusions about that. It was it was kind of interesting to see some of those ideas emerge in the in the '79 book when uh, when it appeared, um, and then of course all all these um, social kinds of things that occurred. The, the one that stands out in my mind was um, a graduate student party that Newbert Dolezal uh, organized, and you saw his picture in several of the slides that uh, we just looked at. Um, uh, a dinner party and, and invited Jimmy to come along because Jackie was out of town someplace and Jimmy came. He uh, appeared at the door, there was a knock on the door, Hubert answered it and Jimmy came in with his drink in a mason jar. <laughs> but he was a, a warm guy who uh, didn't hold back very much when he, uh, when he had something strongly on his mind. Uh, Helen and uh, John mentioned the papers that we were expected to write for the seminar. I still have one of those in my files uh, that I that I treasure um, because it has Jimmy's handwritten comments on it. Um, he didn't like a word of what I said, but I'm um, not going to throw it away uh, because it's the one um, close remembrance I have of that of that contact with him. Danny, I kept, uh, I believe, most of the purple parrots. Do have you explained why they call it the parrots? Well, we we collected all of them that we could find and digitized them, and they're on the web. Oh, good. So, uh, Excellent. We have the form now. Many people um, mm. have have discovered. Good. Excellent. I'll keep mine in the garage then. <laughs> Check it out, maybe you've got something that you don't. Uh, they yes. I'll just say a, a couple things. One, uh, one of the best, strongest memories I have uh, that sort of reinforces what John started with was uh, how much uh, Jimmy liked arguing in intellectual discussion. And my image. Uh, of the department at Cornell when I was there, where uh, Jimmy and Julie Hope were walking down the hall, just arguing, to, uh, and the decibel level was extraordinarily high, and uh, they would walk back and forth, and uh, I think that that uh, infused the graduate students with that same way of exchanging ideas. Uh, Jimmy and Julie uh, were the uh, best, uh, were, were the most vociferous, but Jimmy did the same thing with Oli Smith, who was in some of those photographs. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it's come up that, that Jimmy uh, was a night, a night bird. He, he did work uh, th uh, late into the night, sometimes all night, and uh, there was one uh, wonderful occasion where he, he would never uh, have a class to teach. Uh, somebody mentioned the seminar started at 4 o'clock, but once in a while he would be teaching a perception class that started at noon. And that was pretty early for him to uh, show up. And, and Jackie would often start uh, calling him about 11 o'clock in the morning to be sure he would get to uh, uh, school on time, but uh, one of my fellow graduate students was his teaching assistant, and, uh, and he would, one of his jobs was to go uh, to Jimmy's office about five minutes to 12 to get him to come to class. And so one day, uh, Jimmy had a, a really, uh, well-prepared lecture that he wanted to give. And he came in especially early, about 10 o'clock, and he was working away in his office. And this particular time, my fellow graduate student uh, himself overslept, and he didn't come to uh, get Jimmy to come to class at 5 or 12. Jimmy suddenly discovered that about 12.30 and went to class, and no nobody was there. And the... Uh, 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 my friend uh, struggled in about uh, 
quarter to one or one o'clock and rushed up to uh, Jimmy's office and said, oh, Dr. Gibson, I'm so uh, terribly sorry. And, and Jimmy said, uh, no, no, uh, don't, don't think anything of it. Uh, your mistake was sleeping late and my mistake was depending on you. <laughs> <laughs> But the last thing I wanted to mention was how much uh, Jimmy uh, kept working and reworking his ideas. And uh, David uh, earlier said, uh, I'm not talking about uh, Tal in 1978, I was talking about Tal last night or, or something like that. But, uh, Jimmy came to Minnesota uh, one summer uh, and spent uh, six weeks giving a seminar and talking about one, uh, one of his ideas. And one of the students uh, that was in that seminar uh, attending the summer workshop that uh, some of you know, uh, might know is, is Dean Owen. And uh, Dean uh, uh, liked Jimmy's ideas very much and worked very hard to understand them. And uh, he came back to a subsequent seminar two or three years later that uh, Jimmy was teaching and he came up and said, uh, I, I thought through the ideas that you talked about uh, uh, two years ago, Jimmy, and, and it's really wonderful and I, uh, I like the way you put this, that, and the other thing. And Jimmy said, oh yeah, that's what I used to believe, but that's all wrong. <laughs> But he was constantly revising his ideas and making them richer and better. Well, I believe that Jimmy actually was made uh, chairman of the psychology department for one disastrous year. I think the whole system ground to a halt. <laughs> he, he couldn't uh, do the paperwork or something. He wouldn't come to the office and I'm not sure what happened. I heard about that in the right way. Does anybody else know details about that? <laughs> career of this. Uh, several people left after that. <laughs> they didn't get paid, is that it? <laughs> uh, could, could I ask a question to, to the rest of you? Uh, whether a certain uh, story about Gibson is true or not. Uh, I was told that when he was teaching class, quite often he was just reading from one of his books. And that it happened more than once that in doing so, after he read a passage, he stopped and said, hey, that's a good idea. I've never thought about that before. <laughs> <laughs> Might that have been true? <laughs> Sounds like an absent-minded professor anecdote, but I, can, I don't think he would say that. There was a phrase that, that I recall, um, which seemed to get said more than once, and it was, but you remember what I was saying last semester or whenever, uh, that stuff. Well, let's throw that away and start again. And let's start here this time. And you always had this sense that you're willing to dispense with stuff and try to be more systematic, try to be better, try to for, find a more fundamental place from which to begin. And I, I thought that was just inspiring and wonderful and the sort of thing we should all try to emulate. I have a question. I, it's, it's sometimes said that uh, Gibson was a very hard act to follow for his students and that we have uh, people here on the panel who were students of Gibson's who stayed in the field. But there are many people in the photographs uh, who left the field for one reason or another, um, and there are many others who we know from their names on papers and so on who left the field. So I, I don't know if I've done a count to see if that's a higher rate than is typical for attrition for uh, you know, other, other advisors, but it, it seemed, so that's the question, right? Was, was Gibson you know, asking such fundamental questions and doing such hard work that it was just very difficult for students to um, Follow up on that. Um, Good question. I, Bill may add to this, but I uh, took it upon myself to 
to go back to Cornell a few years ago and go through the old dissertation and card catalog to try to identify all of the uh, Gibson PhDs. And I have a list of that. If anybody's interested, uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to share that list and what other information I have as part of that with, with any of you. But it was interesting to look at that list, Bill, and, and try to figure out where people had gone. Uh, George Kaplan uh, was mentioned a minute ago. Uh, Harry Levin's picture was a nice portrait uh, in there a minute ago. Uh, Harry Levin, in my hearing, said at one time that uh, George and Eleanor Kaplan were the two best graduate students who had ever been through the psychology program at Cornell. Um, to my knowledge, neither one of them is still doing psychology. Um, the, the short answer to your question, I think, is that Gibson um, valued independent thinking in a way that promoted uh, his students doing things that they thought were important and they weren't necessarily Gibsonian perception or even, in many cases, psychology. So I don't know what those numbers look like just off the top of my head, but you're quite right. There, there are quite a number of Gibson students, and both Gibsons, uh, who um, did not stick to academia, did not uh, persist uh, doing perceptual research or, or perceptual development and learning. The, and, and I don't know what the norm would be there, but um, there seem to be substantial numbers who found their own path, went other directions, um, and in substantial numbers of cases, uh, left psychology altogether. Uh, there's a, another factor there is, when you went out and you had a whole lot of Gibsonian arguments and ideas, and you then met the, the average psychologist, it, in my experience, it was, it was difficult to communicate. Uh, and that some of the things you thought were absolutely vital, other people just couldn't see what was important about them. And often what they were doing looked, at least to me, shallow. And I had to learn that uh, what you now do is you support your colleagues. And the kind of vociferous, interesting argument that you engaged in at Cornell, you didn't want to do that with your colleagues. You wanted to be more supportive. You wanted to be clear to be supporting them while clearly having your own line of country. And, and let me just give you one for instance. Um, John Vasily came up to Cornell and gave a talk in which he used the old Hyder and Simmel movie, Things Chasing Around, and then said, See, um, you notice the way you've got sort of social significance here. I'm a social psychologist and I want to talk about this. And um, Endel Tolvin said, well, isn't this just anthropomorphism? You know? And I said, look, this is the basis for anthropomorphism. <laughs> and John Basile got the job. And he tried to continue with the same line of work for about two years. But I don't think a single other social psychologist in the group had any interest at all in what he was doing. And I think that was hard for him. And he then adopted the other line of research and did perfectly well at it. But it was curious to see that, um, that, that, well, that lack of understanding and the effect that it would have on um, a young psychologist who's trying to make his way. And I, I think I learned something from Kevin Dunbar at McGill University who study in labs that are likely to win Nobel Prizes, biology labs. And he says they all maintain two lines of research. The stuff that they think might work out and might get them the Nobel Prize. And the other stuff is bread and butter. And I know that I find it really important for my first five years to have bread and butter stuff that brought in absolutely steady publications, research grants, all that sort of stuff, recognition from my colleagues, while well, I had something else that I thought was far more fundamental I might pay off in the long run. We did. And as, as soon as possible, I basically dropped the other line of research and just stayed with the stuff that I really believed had something deep in it. And it did indeed pay off. And the other stuff is useful and interesting, it's playing games, 
thing to do with subjective contours, and it's very nice and attractive, and the average psychologist understands it, but it did seem to me trivial. And maybe a lot of other people in uh, coming out of the Gibson lab ran into the same kind of thing. And I remember saying to Jimmy one time, and uh, Rosinski was saying exactly the same thing. Both of us were saying it to him uh, over some picnic, which was, you know, it's really curious. The reviews I get if I attack a Gibsonian idea tend to be really pretty positive. And if I'm supporting a Gibsonian idea, it's like I've run into a brick wall. And that might have been really tough for some people. They may not know, may not have known how to crack that particular egg. Um, I, I certainly think I did, but I used a number of techniques and, and then felt, okay, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm now safe, secure, I've got really good stuff that I can carry on with. But it's certainly also true that often the other stuff I had to publish essentially as chapters in books before I could build up enough stuff so that I could have kind of regular experimental type control group and experimental group stuff sitting on top of it. And uh, you had to have a really long view. So it wasn't that easy to push the Gibsonian view uh, and have a lot of other psychologists take a serious, informed interest in it. So I hope that's a bit of a response to what you're saying. And, and by the way, I think that game is kind of gradually won, and you have helped enormously. Rick? Uh, uh, sorry. Bill? Bill Warren, not Rick Warren. <laughs> With all of your papers on flow fields, I think they've just been vital in opening up that territory to a lot of people. And I think when also uh, Martin David Regan attacked you on it, and then the response to it, it just helped uh, people understand a great deal of what was going on. Well, I think you said the paradigm of, of atom, atomism is just endemic in Western society, going back to the Greeks. I think it's just been very hard for people to appreciate the new paradigm that looks at the other end telescope. Uh, maybe both are important, but uh, it doesn't capture the, uh, the functional aspects of perception as Gibson's approach does. Uh, I, let me just uh, one more thing. Uh, and that is, I think the Connecticut group, thank you guys, you, you have sort of created a club in which a lot of the ideas that you want to explore, you can very freely explore them here and take an interest in things. But I, I just don't find that psychonomics, and I don't find that uh, quite a number of the vision or tactile conferences that I go to, and I have to plug away and keep at it. It's, you know, these things are absolutely valuable, and the fact that other people aren't interested is just their problem. But <laughs> thank you very much for keeping the, the stuff going and, uh, and keeping a venue there where you feel there's going to be people here that you want to convince of something you want to learn from. And David Lee, I think, too, just did an enormously important work in keeping the, the time notion and the analysis of the optic array and the simple mathematical functions and the invariants. That example has been a really important exa example uh, for me all along. And despite all this, let me point out that when I went to Uppsala and gave what I thought was a really wonderful talk about all kinds of things, uh, but it didn't have to do with certain areas, uh, Gunnar Johansson was there. He'd gotten out of his sick bed to come and listen to the talk. And then I, I looked over at the end of the talk, and sure enough, this sick man had been listening. And there was his hand up first, and I said, please, you and his, his question was, why are you not working on motion perception? <laughs> well, I went to uh, Cornell from Minnesota, uh, where Herb was one of my colleagues. We had a center there, and my job was primarily to make sense of rule-governed behavior by generalizing off of uh, uh, 
generative grammars uh, from Chomsky and Company. So I was, uh, I met Jimmy and Jackie Gibson at, in 1968 at one of our summer institutes. And I was sitting across from Dean Owen when uh, I had an insight to what Gibson was saying. And it was you know, what he meant by direct perception. He was talking about layout. So we chatted, and then uh, sometime that next uh, fall, uh, I got a call from him asking me to come to Cornell uh, get a leave of absence. And I did, uh, with a threat from my uh, chairman that, well, don't bother to come back kind of thing. And when I, I went, and Jimmy said he had gotten this Senior Career Development Award, and so there was money freed up that they could pay me to teach his perception course. I panicked and I called him back and said, uh, uh, Jimmy, I've never had a perception course. <laughs> I went through, you know, verbal behavior. I went through my graduate training in a couple of years and I didn't learn very much. And he said, well, best way to learn is teaching. So I, I, he said, besides, I'll let you use my notes. I thought, well, okay, you know, this is my job. And uh, so when I got there, it was time for me to start teaching these bright undergraduates at Cornell his course on topics that I knew nothing about. And I went to him and said, uh, Jimmy, can I have your notes now? I need to start planning my talks. He said, oh, oh yes. And he reached around and pulled out the thinnest, I mean, thinnest folder I've ever seen. And I opened it, and in it was saying, tell them about evil courts. <laughs> Give the criticism of Helmholtz. <laughs> Explain what layout means. <laughs> it, it, it was, I was even more panicked then. And so I said, uh, I think I'm really in trouble. I, and I said, uh, Jimmy, someone could help me? He said, oh, yeah. Tom Tolino can, can be your uh, senior uh, assistant, and David DeVillers can be your junior assistant. So I struggled through that year teaching Jimmy's course being tutored before every class by two graduate students who knew a lot more about it than I did. And I was lucky enough, I had David as my office mate out at the lab. And I was always asking David to explain things to me. He probably thought I was an idiot and wondered why I was in the office with him. And, uh, but they did make me a job offer, which I didn't take. But uh, sometimes I wondered what my life would have been like if I had uh, taken that job. Uh, the other thing is I was trying, as everybody did in that seminar, I was trying to write something. And also, that's the other joke. David and I were supposed to be helping him teach that seminar. That's what it was. Yes, you were. <laughs> he, he, he said, no. Because we, we were both, you know, a little senior to the graduate students just because we had jobs. And, uh, yeah, well, I, I went through this trans... First, I called him uh, Professor Gibson. Then uh, he keeps telling me, called me Jimmy. Then I heard the students called him JJ. So then I got where I'd call him JJ, and he'd say, call me Jimmy. And it was years before I could call him Jimmy. So I, I know exactly what that's like. Uh, so I, would write, I wrote something uh, uh, trying to understand invariance. And his, he had comments, and I said, uh, could I see, I saw it paper that I'd given him, and the comments written all over, I said, could I see the comments? He, and he said, oh, oh, no, you don't want to see those comments, those are just for me. And I said, well, I would like to see them. He said, well, you, you might get insulted. And I said, no, that's all right, I can't be insulted. Well, I looked at the comments, they, they, they went something like this in the margin. I was trying to, at that time, integrate Piaget and Gibson and Chomsky and all kinds of garbage, and uh, I was going through it, and, and there would be a question mark in the margin, and things would be underlined. Then all of a sudden, some things would be crossed out, and he, there'd be something like, EGATS! And then <laughs> he'd go on down, and he'd say, what? You know, and then finally, he'd say, nuts! And then at, by the time, time we got to the end of the paper, there was one word that said, phooey! <laughs> My message on my papers, uh, he was quite religious actually. He would say, Good God! <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we should. Um...
Stacy. This is about in the portal choir. We'll finish with David. Okay. I'd just like to say, um, for the record, as it were, um, Jim, that Jimmy completely transformed my life. And just, it happened actually when I was at Harvard. And um, I'd come from doing po postgraduate work in London. Um, grad yes, postgraduate work in London. And I'd done courses in perception. And I got completely disillusioned with everything. And I was speaking to somebody in, uh, at Harvard, um, and he said, well, have you ever read Gibson, he said. And I said, who's he? Because I hadn't I'd never been taught anything about Gibson in London, which actually reflects a bit on what John was saying, I think. Um, anyway, I read The Perception of the Visual World and was transformed overnight, just with the first few words, actually that it was about, this is about how we see the world, how we get around in the world. All the other stuff I've been reading was, I don't know, it's, it was about this experimental paradigm, that experimental paradigm, and so forth. Anyway, it completely transformed me, and then I, I, I met Gibson a bit later, um, as a EPS, EPA conference in Boston, and, um, and then we did, I visited Cornell, and eventually came here um, and met Bob, um, for a year in 1969-70, and uh, the rest is history, really. I mean, it was, I had all the experiences um, that everybody else has been talking about. The warmness, and the big arguments, the fact that you could never convince him if, uh, if he was very dogged and we couldn't be convinced of, uh, of certain things he'd never get through. But um, it was a very stimulating atmosphere and uh, very, very formative. And uh, he's a great person to, to be around. So I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you all. As usual, we have a lot to continue to develop in the conference. So it's never over. <laughs>